left on the dock for more than 24 hours will be compressed to a cube at the owner's expense. Welcome to Sacred Cow Shipyards. So as all of my fans should know, that is to say both of you, the sequel, or the second part, that is to say, of the Dune movie series is not really a series. I mean, it has one part and then a second part, so whatever you call that. Anyways, the second part of the Dune movie just came out this weekend on your planet, assuming you're watching this episode as it airs. Suffice to say, in a bizarre stroke of me planning ahead, I did actually plan this episode to come out when the Dune second part dropped. How just massively out of character for me. But anyways, as we have talked about previously, the Duneverse is, um, complicated. Let's go with complicated. The Duneverse as a whole probably stands as an entire episode or series of episodes by itself, let's be honest here. There is so much going on. And we did previously talk about the concept of the Highliners, the vehicles that are used for interstellar travel by way of basically housing a navigator and then other ships bolt onto or into it. And the whole thing more or less instantaneously travels faster than light between point A and point B. And behold, you are at point B, so now you can get off and go about your merry business. It's complicated. It's moderately terrifying. It did not work great until they had navigators, who are people who are so saturated with spice, melange, the substance that comes from Dune, otherwise known as Arrakis, that they can literally perceive individual potential futures. And their goal on the Highliner is to perceive, to identify a specific future where they don't, you know, run into something. And that's really what it boils down to. Whether or not the Holtzman engine on the Highliner folds space instantaneously or not, the fact of the matter is, once you start folding space, you are committed. Wherever you're going is where you're going to end up. And if you happen to end up inside of a planet or something, that's bad for you, and technically bad for the planet, too. It's, it's bad for everyone involved. And before navigators, there were technically ways of calculating potential safe routes, they were not great. And then y'all figured out that if you just expose a Humi to spice and keep exposing a Humi to spice and keep saturating him with spice to the point that he becomes a mutated facsimile of what he used to be, then he can literally see limited futures. I mean, he can't see like the whole future. That is something that is reserved for a separate character that I'm sure the second part of the movies got into at some point, which we're not going to talk about right now. But yes, the, the navigators provided a, a safer way of folding space. But we're actually not here to talk about the Highlander. Sorry, I got distracted as I always do. Instead, we are here to talk about the Flappy Flappies. Um, the Ornithopters, otherwise referred to as Thopters. Uh, the, the concept of ornithopters, I think, dates back to, like, Leonardo da Vinci on your planet or something, where he started hypothesizing that maybe men could actually, like, fly like the birds do. I'm sure the idea of actually predates him, but he at least, like, wrote it down and documented it pretty well, so we're going to run with that regardless. Well, the thopters in the uh, most recent Dune series of movies are not... I would argue ornithopters. Instead, I would actually argue that they are anisothopters. As in, like, anisoptera. As in dragonflies. You see, ornithopters, ornithopters, the term ornis or ornith, and the whether it's a prefix or a term or whatever, it doesn't really matter, refers to birds on your planet because they are all part of the the group, the clade, I, I don't even know what the right terms are, but regardless, all birds on your planet are part of the group Ornithurae. Ornith, again, Ornithopter. 
And then the second part of the term ornithopter is actually pteron, meaning wing. So literally bird wing. Now, technically on your planet, the term ornithopter does in fact refer to any vehicle that uses flapping wings as in bird style or bat style or insect style. So I shouldn't complain too much about the thopters in the most recent Dune movies basically being modeled off dragonflies on your planet, but I would still argue there is a slight, somewhat significant, difference. I mean, if nothing else, all of the birds on your planet, if birds on your planet are even real, I think they all have two wings, give or take a little. Whereas the thopters in uh, Dune have a minimum of four, and most of them have eight wings. Now, I'm not familiar with any dragonfly on your planet that has eight wings. It probably exists. I just don't know about it. Most of them appear to have four wings. Beyond that, the thopters in the Duneverse have a very defined head, thorax, and abdomen. The head, of course, is where the pilots naturally sit. The thorax is kind of the cargo bay or passenger bay. And then the abdomen is a long stem at the stern of the craft that has unknown purpose or use. It might be where the power plant is. It might be where power storage is. It might just be there to balance the craft. I have no idea. The abdomen on a dragonfly on your planet seems to predominantly be geared towards reproduction, and I don't know how Dune does it, but probably not that way. Although there were actually... Uh, there were hypotheses uh, born out in the Dune Encyclopedia, which is considered to be non-canonical, although there's some disagreement over that in general, that the ornithopter's engine is actually just a special bioengineered mollusk somewhat similar to a, a gallop on your planet so i guess the abdomen might have to do with reproduction who knows but anyways i'm just belaboring the point dragonflies aren't ornaths i mean that's that's basically the whole point there but moving on you really have to consider the practicality of a flappy flappy vehicle on a desert planet and you really have to question why anyone would do that when you have faster than light travel and interstellar ships and this that and the blessed other well, the short answer is that you technically don't have to. The same Holtzman effect that allows highliners to fold space and for personal shields to make, well, the shields as well as all other shields in Dune also allows for you to physically repel a vehicle from the ground. The suspensors is what they call them. And these suspensors can be used for everything from literal buildings to glow globes to starships to whatever. So why don't you just use this no-joke anti-gravity technology you have laying around just collecting dust? Well, it's basically the same reason you don't use shields out in the deserts of Dune, and why you don't land starships outside of the shield wall. Because it pisses off the sandworms. For some reason, the specific harmonic that any kind of Holtzman field generator creates really aggravates the sandworms, and they immediately come charging out of everywhere to try and destroy whatever is making that god-awful racket. So, no suspensers for you. Sorry. Now, why don't the great houses use, say, like helioflopters or some other simple low-level technology? I have no idea. I imagine Frank Herbert thought that ornithopters simply sounded cooler, and let's go with that instead. But, I mean, you really have to feel for the poor Atreides, uh, like, flight engineers, flight crew, maintenance staff, when they're told that they're going to a desert planet with a flappy, flappy vehicle. Think of the number of moving parts on this vehicle and how complex and complicated they might be. And then think about sand. It's coarse, and it's rough, and irritating, and it gets everywhere. And while salt water has a particular hatred for everything and everyone on your planet, sand specifically, deliberately despises moving things. Just specifically moving things. If you're still, it, I mean, it'll erode you eventually, but that's a long-term process. Moving things? Oh yeah, it'll grind you into dust. I mean, the USAians have been documenting their difficulty with sand since the 1980s and the whole Iran affair, where one of their helicopters attempting to rescue people developed all kinds of problems because it simply ingested too much sand. And that's just the engine, the turbine that powers the helicopter. You've also got the big spinny bit on top. You've got all the sensitive avionics, all the airspeed indicators, all the things on a helicopter already don't like being there. It's a thousand moving pieces orbiting an oil leak. And then you just throw a deliberate abrasive into the equation and see what happens. Predictably bad things. I mean, the Army Research Laboratory has been working on this problem for literal decades and have come up with some really interesting ideas, but I'm getting off track again. So you have enough difficulty with rotating 
drive mechanisms in a sandy environment. And now you want to introduce an oscillating drive mechanism into a sandy environment. The f*** is wrong with you guys? Now, in fairness, yes, the thopters in the Duniverse can actually lock their blades and engage a jet engine to propel themselves at higher velocities when they are at altitude. But they only get to altitude by doing the floppy floppy thing. And the floppy floppy thing is going to burn all kinds of metal inside of it as the sand gets in there and does naughty, naughty things. And then even with a jet propulsion system, you're still back to the problem that jet turbines do not like sand. I mean, I guess technically they could be using some sort of ramjet system, which is why they have to be aloft and moving before they can actually engage the jet system. But then you're just sucking up a whole pile of sand, attempting to turn it into glass inside of your drive mechanism, and then shooting it out your stern and hopefully none of it globs on. That does not seem like an optimal solution to me. And that's without even getting into all the wear and tear on the entire skin of the vehicle just by simply being exposed to repeated sandstorms since apparently no one on Dune believes in hangars, much less flying in the actual environment itself. Now, yes, I am making some massive assumptions about the materials and composition thereof that the Atreides and all the other great houses in the Duneverse have available to them. I mean, for fuck's sake, Dune takes place approximately 20,000 years further down your timeline, so if y'all haven't figured out better materials to use by then, I don't know what to tell you. Although, interestingly, that does mean that technically, your current time, the Duneverse, and the Warhammerverse can all exist on the same timeline if you squint hard enough and, and look away from a certain number of details. Yeah, that's scary as fuck. But anyway, speaking of material developments, I guess the bioengineered scallop hypothesis makes a certain degree of sense there as well. I mean, 20,000 years from now, y'all could certainly bioengineer a specifically built mollusk to do flappy flappy things. And they're so bioengineered that they're hooked up to electrical uh, conductors, one of which like literally shocks the poor thing into dormancy. And then of course, if power goes out, it'll wake back up again and start flappy flapping again. And then the other one kind of adjusts like how quickly it's flappy flapping. So you can do altitude and speed adjustments, of course. Um, that's kind of horrible. Also very Warhammer-ish. Also, I don't buy it personally. Although I suppose on the good news side of things, if you take a bioengineered mollusk engine for an ornithopter to a desert planet, and oh my god, this sentence just got really f***ing weird, didn't it? Anyways, if you take a bioengineered mollusk to a desert planet, you're gonna have no shortage of what are those little brown things called? Uh, pearls. I mean, you'll be, you'll be just stumbling in pearls as it, these things just keep sucking up all the desert air and dust and dirt and crap and cr cranking out pearls nonstop. So I guess there's that. But anyways, I, like I said, just don't buy the, the genetically engineered super scallop keeping this thing aloft or even being a reasonable explanation on how they work to begin with. Maybe the second movie explains that that is in fact the case, and well, I guess I'll be wrong. But for the time being, I'm just going to approach the ornithopters as a purely mechanical device. And again, sand absolutely despises purely mechanical devices. But since we're going to do some assumptions and possibly even do some math as terrifying as that is... I should lay out all the assumptions before we get started. That is, after all, good science, and we know the only difference between science and f***ing around is documenting it. First off, like I mentioned, we're going to assume that the vehicles are entirely mechanical. Secondly, I can't find really good specifications on their length, width, or height, much less their wingspan. There is, in fact, a Lego set out now that I assume is built to scale in the proper ornithopter, and I suppose if I could get one shipped out to the shipyard and I sat down and counted dots, I could probably figure out some sort of math. But minifig scale to human scale is not always consistent, so that might not even be right either. Instead, I'm just going to blanket assume that each wing on one of the standard House Atreides ornithopters, the eight-winged variety, the, the combat variety, if you want to get right down to it, is approximately 60 feet in length, giving the craft a total wingspan of 120 feet plus whatever space is in the middle for the passenger compartment. On top of that, I'm going to assume that each stroke, that is to say the upper and lower limit of each wing's motion, is approximately 10 feet. It's probably less than that in reality, but we're just going to go 10 because it's a nice round number. Moving on, we are going to assume that the wings maintain their orientation, basically, through each stroke. We know this is wrong. They actually show that in the movie, uh, how the wings can actually rotate around the joint to which they connect to the rest of the craft, and that has to make sense. After all, the wings are flat relative to the ground on the downstroke, and then they almost certainly point up on the upstroke, both to decrease drag, naturally, and to actually allow it to, you know, flap. 
However, as wrong as that assumption is, it makes the math a lot easier, and we all know how lazy I am. Finally, or possibly finally, we'll see, we are going to assume that the flappy flappy rate on the ornithopter in Dune is approximately 10,000 beats per minute. Yeah, that sounds like a lot, and it honestly is, but I did at least base it on some premise of reality in your universe slash planet. The fastest hummingbird on your planet flaps its wings approximately 5,000 times a minute. And yes, given 20,000 years of technological advancement like we talked about previously, it is possible to conceive that the thopters in Dune are made of materials that are stronger and lighter than that of a hummingbird body. However, it's fair to say that the humans involved have approximately the same density. And y'all be heavy, let's be honest here. So obviously, the, the density slash mass of a hummingbird is not going to be sufficient to scale up to something that can carry, what, nine humans or something like that? So I basically took the number and doubled it. Like I said, these are all assumptions, and assumptions are inherently flawed. For example, the final assumption is kind of going to uh, build on the, the wings stay in the same direction assumption that we made earlier, and that is I am going to assume a constant acceleration and deceleration over the course of each flap. Naturally, this is wrong, but it does make the math a lot easier. And now finally, before we get to the good stuff, actually finally this time, I will stress that I had one of my minions do all of the math, because once again, I am lazy. So, some of this is probably going to be wrong. If it is wrong, feel free to, well, actually me. I won't actually mind it too much this time. After all, we just crush it. We don't try to make it work. Anyways, back to the numbers. As we mentioned previously, we're going to assume a wing of 60 feet in length and a flap distance of 10 feet. And yes, we are in fact going to continue using the Gone to the Moon units. And yes, I know that joke isn't actually accurate because NASA typically does their math in metric. But it's still funny. And I'm just going to use the Imperial just because, yeah. Most of my audience is in the United States of America, so there you go. That's my excuse. Anyways, 60 feet, 10 feet. 10,000 times per minute. That gives us an average tip speed of approximately 1,666.66666 bar feet per second. If that sounds fast, that's because it is. For comparison, helicopter tip speeds on your planet max out somewhere in the 700 to 800 feet per second range. Likewise, the round from your inimitable 1911 handgun averages, depending on loading and, and bullet weight and so on and so forth, somewhere in the 1,000 feet per second range. In fact, the speed of sound is in fact 1,125 feet per second at sea level, assuming normal atmosphere. So, yeah, the happy little ornithopters are making little tiny sonic booms every time they flap. I'm already seeing a problem. But that's just the average speed. After all, this is a flap. The wings technically stop, however briefly, at the top and bottom of each stroke. Ha. Uh, ha. Uh. Anyways, um, there's obviously acceleration and deceleration and a top speed involved in the equation as well. Well, again, given a 10-foot flap with a 60-foot wing 10,000 times per minute, you're looking at a top speed somewhere in the neighborhood of 3,333 feet per second. Good. Fuck. Arguably the fastest commercial cartridge on your planet for your primitive slug-throwing firearms is the .220 Swift, and its average speed is somewhere in the 3,500 feet per second range. So yeah, those wingtips be truckin', yo! And if you were previously concerned about a just-over Mach 1 sonic boom, imagine a Mach 3-ish sonic boom 10,000 times a minute. Granted, they're not going to be very large, just because the, the thing moving around isn't very large. But still, that can't be safe for the humans anywhere nearby, and it certainly can't be good for the metal that the, the wing is made of. But don't worry, things are about to get so much worse for the metal involved. Or whatever material they're using. They could be using some sort of complicated composites. The renderings look like metal, but that, maybe that's just wear and tear. It's hard to say. I'm going to go with metal. Let's just call it metal. As I mentioned, these wings, of course, flap. They go up and down. And at some point in the process, twice in fact, at the top and bottom, they stop. They decelerate down from 3,000 feet per second, in excess of that, in fact. And then they turn around and do it all over again. Well, that's going to make some really interesting G-loading. Because you see, helicopter blades always spin in the same direction. I mean, there is, of course, centripetal force, which is kind of sort of a thing. It's a complicated topic on your planet. But the force of the blade spinning roundy, roundy, roundy just wants to pull it out. And the structure of the blade kind of prevents that from happening, naturally. If you're doing a flappy, flappy maneuver instead, 
the force wants to pull the blade down at the downstroke and up at the upstroke. You're, you're, you're encountering forces that want the tip to keep going while the rest of the blade is already trying to go down or up the other direction, whatever you want to phrase it. And assuming a rigid body that it has no deformation in it, because again, I'm lazy and I'm not going to do the goddamn structural engineering calculations because holy fuck, they're complicated as hell. And I don't know the materials involved. Again, like we talked about, I'm just trying to simplify this. Mostly because I'm lazy and honestly, the explanation would get really, really boring. But anyways, assuming a rigid structural wing flapping 10,000 times per minute with a wing length of 60 feet and a flap of 10 feet, at each end of the flap, the tip of the blade is going to experience somewhere in the neighborhood of 95 Gs as the wing stops going up and starts going down very, very quickly. 95 Gs. As a reminder, a G is equivalent to 9.8 meters per second squared or around 32 feet per second squared. You are experiencing 1G as you simply sit on your planet right now. The space shuttle, the maximum Gs the astronauts experienced during both launch and re-entry was approximately 3Gs. On the Dragon platform flown by SpaceX, it gets closer to 4.5Gs. Apollo 16 came in hot and spicy on her return re-entry at 7.19Gs. And the maximum G load that Red Bull air race planes are allowed to experience is 10 G's. Yes, that Red Bull, the crazy company on your planet. They only allow their pilots to go up to 10 G's. Of course, if you have to eject out of an aircraft, you'll be experiencing somewhere between 15 and 25 G's, but wait, it gets worse. The highest G load ever experienced by a human being on your planet is 46.2 G's. And that was by a certain gentleman by the name of John Stapp. And the reason that the seat belts in your quaint little internal combustion engine automobiles on your planet are configured the way they are is because of the research he did in how humans respond to acceleration and deceleration. In fact, he's got a law to his name, of course, the Stapp's Law. The universal aptitude for ineptitude makes any human accomplishment an incredible achievement. Can't say I really disagree with the man. But seriously, exposing a wingtip to 95 Gs 10,000 times a minute, that's going to cause some wear and tear on the metal. I don't care how rigid it might be. I don't care how flexible it might be because both actually pose different problems in terms of getting this ornithopter off the ground. Eventually, something's going to break. And it's going to break catastrophically, and bitty bits are going to go everywhere and at obscenely high velocities. I mean, even if you scale down my assumption, at least on the flappy flappy speed, to the top speed of the fastest hummingbird in your planet, that is to say 5,000 beats per minute, that's still really f***ing fast. That puts the peak speed somewhere around a helicopter on your planet's average speed, but that still doesn't solve the g-force problem at the tips. I mean, naturally it reduces it, but it's still basically there. This is the fundamental problem with any kind of dragonfly style, insect style, hummingbird style, however you want to phrase it, ornithopter. If you want to have big, slow, flapping wings, like say an albatross on your planet or something like that, you can get away with that. You can do big, slow things, even with your current mechanics right now. They don't scale up very well yet. I'm very curious to see what you guys manage to pull out in the end, but it's possible. And who knows, high-speed vibrators might be possible 20,000 years in the future, too. I guess you should be careful with those. But you're still running up against the physics of the atmosphere around you. I have to assume that Arrakis and Caladan, where these ornithopters were designed and built, have basically Earth-type atmospheres. So, speed of sound is speed of sound on both of them, and much like your Earth right now. So, when these ornithopters get up to speed... They doing some noisy business at their tips. It would be like 10,000 whip cracks, only really big, really thick whips every minute. You would lose your hearing around them within seconds. But oh no, after all of this bad news, we haven't actually got to the worst aspect of the movie. And I will actually fault the movie for this part, the most recent movie, because they actually totally, absolutely fucked this up. 
And yes, I was saving the best for the last so all the whiners would be somewhere else by now. Sue me. Anyways, the Duniverse has laser guns, las guns, whatever you want to call them. They appear to operate more or less like lasers do in your universe, which, which I guess makes a certain degree of sense. Light amplification is light amplification. However, they do interesting things when they interface with the sh protective shields generated by the Holtzman effect. Remember that thing that allows for like faster than light travel and for hover vehicles and so on and so forth? Yes, it also generates the protective shields that individuals and even up to starships can deploy around themselves. And as always, in the Duniverse, the slow knife kills. These shields stop any high velocity object from piercing them. But if you come in slow enough, you can sneak through the shield and stab the person. This is why swords and knives and uh, very slow dart throwers and stuff like that are such popular weapons in the Duniverse. However, there's a catch when you shoot a shield with a las gun. Both explode. Actually, quite catastrophically, it is likened to a nuclear explosion. So why, in the unholy f***, when the Harkonnens were invading Arakeen, were they hunting down Duncan Idaho's Thopter, clearly shielded Thopter, with a las gun? I mean, yeah, I get that he's causing a catastrophic mess for your poor little invasion, but you just whacked him with a missile and you could clearly see that there were shields around that ornithopter. Why would you want to blow up one of your capital ships just to tag a lowly ornithopter? And then level a massive chunk of the city in the process, although I guess the uh, Harkonnens didn't actually seem to care about that particular aspect. Unless you misunderstand and you haven't read the books, this is actually made out to be quite a large deal in the books. You don't shoot shields with las guns it's just a really really bad idea for everyone involved so for all the things that the movie got right and there are quite a few of them boy did they fuck that one up so anyways do i think you humies are eventually going to figure out ornithopters maybe i mean they're probably going to look more like the large orniths on your planet rather than insects rapidly flapping their wings but they sure did look cool in the movie I mean, the attention to detail and the extent to which they considered the mechanical interface of the vehicle itself was quite impressive. I do wish they had gotten the shield detail a little more correct, and I feel bad for the ground crews who just have their hearing blown away by non-stop little tiny sonic booms. But, I mean, human life in the Duniverse is pretty cheap, so it probably doesn't matter in the end. And that's all from Sacred Cow Shipyards. Please be advised that any ship left on the docks for more than 24 hours will be compressed to a cube at the owner's expense. Have a nice day.